Could you do me a quick favor if you're listening to this? Please hit the follow or subscribe button. It helps more than you know. And we invite subscribers in every month to watch the show in person. Am I doing everything in my power to live the way I want to live? Because if it could be over in a moment, I got to shift my attention to things that really matter. Our next guest has quite the resume. A former professional football player turned lifestyle entrepreneur. Who was making millions of dollars and helping others achieve their dreams. New York Times bestselling author. School of Greatness. Please welcome Lewis House. You have been very, very open about the abuse you suffered when you were five. I mean, I knew something was wrong. I knew something was off. Every single day for 25 years, I thought about it. I needed to heal the memories of the past in order to create a healthy relationship with myself and others in the present. The challenge is most men have not been taught how to effectively communicate their guilt, their insecurities. Constantly working on yourself is huge in intimacy and relationships. What is the single biggest killer of relationships? I'm going to say something right now that you're probably not going to like. So without further ado, I'm Stephen Bartlett, and this is The Diary of a CEO. I hope nobody's listening, but if you are, then please keep this to yourself. Lewis, I have to start with a, with a point of gratitude, which is thank you so much for doing this. You are, and I don't say this lightly, but you are one of the real inspirations for me in this whole podcasting content space because you've been you, you're like the goat in my eyes you're, you've, mm. you're the guy that did it first in in our space mm. and did it best at the same time but not just that when I got to meet you maybe a month ago in Dubai I was pretty much in awe of a, a bunch of things that I noticed about you that really set you apart one of them was this real unbelievable self-awareness which I talked to my team about before you got here I said he's one of the most self-aware guys that I've ever met because he's done and doing the work mm. and the second thing is there's actually three, probably three things that come to mind. The second thing is your genuine curiosity about humans on a very deep level. Because we'd be having, we were having a conversation at 2 a.m. in a bar. And <laughs> if there was a, a moment of silence, it would be interjected by you with like a, tell me three things that you're, your biggest failings mm-hmm. in life or three things. You, and I just thought, this is a guy that doesn't want to mess around at surface level with small talk no. and things that don't matter. And then the third point, which kind of links to those two in some way, is your unbelievable ability to speak and deliver a concept or an idea with wisdom and a personal anecdote attached in a way that's captivating to the point that people don't tune out when you're talking. Mm. And I don't, I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, but I genuinely was like, I need to learn this. (laughs) Specifically that delivery of ideas and having seen you on Jay's and Tom Mm. Bilyeu's podcast, Mm -hmm. I saw it then again. And it's a culmination of all that self-awareness and practice. But there was something else which you showed me when we were in Dubai having that conversation at 2am in the morning, which is where I wanted to start our conversation today, which was the the screensaver of your phone. Mm -hmm. That really stayed with me. Yeah. Can you tell me what the screensaver of your phone is? This is, uh, yeah, I don't know if you guys, for those watching on YouTube, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is a photo of myself uh, when I was probably about five years old. And um, I put it on there a year ago because I was doing some intensive... I would say inner child healing with a therapist I was working in in, a, in another relationship that I was ending. I was ending a relationship. And I realized that in relationships in the past, I was repeating a pattern of people pleasing, of saying yes to things that I didn't want to say yes to, of changing and shifting who I authentically was in order to try to please or make someone else happy. And a lot of it came from the dynamics of my childhood, from being sexually abused, from having just a challenging, let's say, family dynamic uh, with parents and things like that. And so for years, I was never taught on how to deal with my inner child. I never was taught how to heal the things that I was really wounded as a child. And so having these experiences of intensive emotional intelligence and therapy training on dealing with previous relationships and then in a current relationship was extremely helpful for me. And my my therapist said, we gotta heal that part of your life that is attached to a memory of a wound. And unless you heal that, you're gonna keep repeating certain patterns. And so that's why I had that on there. And I'm actually gonna change it to a different period of time in my life when I was about 11 to 12. That's the next phase of growth for me is to actually heal that next stage. So that's why I do it. What was the the world and the perception of the world that that five-year-old Lewis House saw and felt? 
What was he feeling and seeing? Oh man, he was abandoned, he was abused, he was taken advantage of, he was unworthy, he was unlovable. And that was what I believed. And so it's hard to create a meaningful relationship with myself and with another person if that story or narrative or belief was still there for me, which it was unconsciously. So I needed to heal the memories of the past in order to create a healthy relationship with myself and others in the present. And where did that story come from that he was unlovable? I've mm. heard you describe yourself even as thinking you were dumb, mm -hmm. thinking you, you couldn't, you weren't worthy of friendships and things like that. Absolutely. Where did all of that? I mean, it was all from real life experiences and results that I was experiencing. So just getting picked on as a kid, feeling neglected from parents and family members, feeling, you know, again, sexual abuse that I dealt with and struggling throughout school my entire childhood until it took me seven years to finish college. I was in the bottom of my class in school, elementary, middle and high school. And so the narrative was there were real world results that were showing me that I was unlovable or being taken advantage of or abused or these things. And so that stayed with me. And this is why I built a persona or really a mask. I tried to mask it and defend myself by becoming a great athlete, by getting bigger, faster and stronger so that I could defend myself against the, the feeling of being taken advantage of or abused. But that didn't leave me feeling fulfilled. It left me feeling angry and resentful. When you were, you, you have been very, very open about the abuse you suffered when you were five from a babysitter's mm -hmm. son, yep. I believe. Yep. Did you understand at the time that it was abuse? No, I had no idea. I mean, I knew something was wrong. I knew something was off, but I didn't know. I mean, as a five-year-old, I don't think anyone really knows how to emotionally handle that or emotionally regulate or understand what's really happening at that time. But it was something that I lived with for every single day for 25 years, I thought about it. I thought about the instant, whether it be consciously or unconsciously, it was coming up. It might be a second or it might be minutes long of a memory, but it came up pretty much every, every day for 25 years until I went through it a, a, a transformational workshop experience that got me to finally face it. And it wasn't until I faced it and started to integrate the healing of that moment that I felt like I was a prisoner for so long until it set me free of actually talking about my shame, expressing it, communicating it with my friends, my family. And then eventually I did a podcast about it, which took me about six months to publish because I recorded it. And I waited six months because I said, if people knew this about me, no one would love me. My business is over. I'm going to have no friends if, if people actually knew how shameful this thing was for me. And I think that was the biggest fear. But it, what I realized, this was back in 2013, maybe the end of 2013, early 2014. I and I thought my, I literally thought my life was over. I was like, no one is going to love me. But I, I, I also thought to myself, I can no longer be a prisoner inside with this information. I need to let it out. And if I can help one man heal from what they've been through, then it's worth it. I'm happy to lose everything if I can help one man. And it was one of the most profound experiences and, and really spiritually freeing experiences of my life was opening up, talking about it. And the aftermath was so powerful. For weeks, I was getting essays from men opening up saying, you know, I'm married. I've got three kids, I'm 55, my wife and kids don't know, and I've been holding this with me for this long. It happened to me when I was 11. You know, men opening up about all the different experiences of sexual abuse or trauma that they face with. The challenge is most men have not been taught how to effectively communicate their shame, their guilt, their insecurities. There's not many guys that grow up I don't think you had guy friends when you were 12, 15, 18, 23, saying, you know what, can we just have a coffee and talk about how shameful I feel about my, my, uh, my past right now? Or I don't really feel that good today. Let's talk about it. Or my body image is kind of off. Like we don't do that generally as men. We're not taught how to do that in society. But when you ask women, how often do you meet with a girlfriend on a weekly basis to talk about your shame, your insecurities, the challenges you're dealing with in your relationships, 
struggles at work, whatever it might be, women typically say they, they meet with their girlfriends every week, if not every single day, they'll have a conversation with a girlfriend, a sister, a mom about a challenge mm. or just what's on their mind. But we just haven't been taught that. So I, started, I really wanted to change the narrative uh, and be a model. There was no one that looked like me growing up that talked about these things. There was no athlete that I admired that was like on TV saying, I'd been sexually abused or I went through childhood trauma or I didn't love myself, or I struggled with insecurities growing up. I didn't, just didn't see that growing up as a kid. So my goal was to be a model of saying, you know, I'm willing to lose everything if I can help men heal, because I truly believe a lot of the pain caused in the world is caused by men who have massive wounds, who are reactive because they don't know how to handle or regulate their emotions. And so they react in certain scenarios, whether it be domestic violence, domestic abuse, war, uh, just reactions on social media causing more stress, screaming in a workplace, whatever it might be, driving here in London, just people honking at the horn because they are they don't know how to handle their inner wounds, their emotional regulation. And I feel like if all humans, but men specifically, can continue to learn these tools, it'll be powerful. But we weren't taught this in school. There was nothing in school that was like, Okay, emotional regulation 101 class. There was none of this. It was just suck it up, be a man, toughen up. Don't, you know, we don't talk about these things. So, and I think the world has been shifting over the last four or five years as well, where it's more acceptable for men to talk about it with, you know, social media in a good sense, allowing men to be more vulnerable and kind of lifting these conversations up about mental health. So I'm seeing that shift, but I just didn't see that or have a model when I was growing up terms of models when you were growing up. Could you tell me a little bit about the dynamics of your parents as well? Because I've heard you describe that early life and um, yeah, the quote that I, that I read from you was that they were miserable times and the tension mm -hmm. in the house impacted you and your siblings. Yeah, I mean, I grew up, it's challenging because my father just passed away a month and a half ago. And for 17 years, he... He got in an accident 17 years ago uh, with a car accident where a car came up on his car, hit him through the windshield and split his head open. He was in a coma for a few months, had severe brain trauma, stayed alive miraculously, but just had a challenging 17 years where he never fully recovered. So it was, a, it was an interesting dynamic with my dad the last 17 years. Growing up as the youngest of four, my siblings, I feel like probably had it worse than me. They had to deal with, you know, 20 year old parents. My, my parents were 20 when they had my brother and then 24 when they had my sister and then 28 when they had my other sister and then they had me at 31. Mm -hmm. So they had to deal, you know, grow up with parents who didn't have these tools either. So I have a lot of grace for my parents because they didn't have the tools of emotional regulation or how to communicate effectively or how to process wounds. And I think if you don't know how to process wounds, it's gonna be hard to just interact without being defensive or reactive or, you know, all, all these different things, passive aggressive. So I grew up for the first 13 years of my life in fear, in fear. I knew my parents loved me, but there was this like energy that felt fearful. And I was afraid of my father. Why? <sighs> he was pretty angry. He was an angry guy and he would he was super loving, but then he would explode at times because he didn't know how to process emotions. And he had wounds. And so that was the challenging thing. It was, it was confusing. And they weren't loving towards each other. So I didn't feel safe. My brother went away to prison when I was eight years old for, for four and a half years. So every weekend we would travel two, year, uh, two hours to go to a prison visiting room and see my brother for a few hours. So I was exposed to things that I probably shouldn't have been exposed to at eight years old until 12, which expanded my mind and my, my, my worldview and my perception of people, but also it was just challenging to have a sibling in jail for that long and dealing with the dynamics of that. Yeah, it was just a, it was a challenging time. But at 13, I begged my parents to send me away. I went to a private boarding school at 13 uh, for middle school and high school, and I couldn't get away fast enough. They didn't send me away because I was a bad kid. I begged them to send me away because I didn't feel safe at home. 
I really want to dig into that. Mm. What was it, your dad's anger and his, his anger directed, I guess, at you or your siblings or your All mom, of us, yeah. All of us? But it wasn't all the time, you know? So again, he was a loving guy. He would tuck me into bed at night. He would play catch with me in the backyard. But then there'd be. But then there'd be an explosion. And we just didn't know when it would be. And so the beautiful part about my dad is he had a massive transformation when I turned 13. He started to dive into the emotional intelligence training workshops and, and seeking wisdom on how to process his emotions. And he had incredible you know, healing transformation. So from 13 to 21, I had this incredible relationship with my dad. He would fly out to all my games. He would be so loving and supportive. He, he wasn't angry. He wasn't reactive. He had this transformation. So it's almost like I had two lives with my dad. The first half of first 13 years, I loved him, but I was also afraid of him. 13 to 21, he was like my best friend. And so when he got in his accident, when I was around 21, it was devastating. Cause now I didn't have a mentor that now was showing up in a different way, was loving, was vulnerable. I saw him cry a lot more. I saw him just be sensitive. So when he got in his accident, I didn't have that anymore. He wasn't able to have that relationship with me because of the brain accident. And this was a time when I felt like I needed it the most, right? I went to go play arena football. I went to go chase a dream. I got injured in the, at the end of the first season, had a surgery with my wrist. And at that time, it was 2000, end of 2007, 2008, the economy was crashing in USA. People weren't hiring those who had master's degrees. I barely graduated with a, you know, just mm -hmm. a, a general degree. I'm living on my sister's couch for a year and a half. I've got no money. I've got no mentorship from my father. And so in a sense, it was almost like, this is the weird thing when I reflect back on it, because I don't think I would be the man I am today without his accident. Although I wish he didn't have the accident. I don't think I'd be in service. I don't think I would care about people as much. I don't think I'd be on a mission to want to change lives and serve millions of people around the world. I don't think I'd be doing an interview show or a podcast. I don't think I'd be writing books or all these things. But something shifted within me because he was physically alive, but emotionally and mentally not there. So I didn't have that access to a relationship. Something shifted in me where I couldn't rely on him for money, for kind of that wisdom. I had to, I just had to unleash something new that was, that I didn't think was inside of me. And I don't know if your parents are still around or if your dad is still they around. Are, yeah, yeah. Something shifted in me 17 years ago when my dad got in the accident. And then something shifted even more in the last month and a half when he passed that is hard to explain. I don't know. I haven't really fully processed it. It's still kind of a processing time. And there's some, a lot of gratitude and memories, but a lot of sadness tied to it. But I just don't think I'd be the man I am without his accident because it made me unleash something inside of me that was untapped. When I met you in Dubai, every topic you talked on, you talked on as if you'd processed it and done work on it and you mm -hmm. had a perspective on it. And then when you spoke about your dad, it was like the end of what we call a cul-de-sac, getting to the end of a street where there's nowhere else to go. It was like you hadn't, mm -hmm. the conversation ended there mm -hmm. and you would look down at the floor. Yeah. And I knew, I'm so sorry to hear of your loss, by the way, but Thank I could you. see that it was still something that you're, I could, there was two kind of suspicions I had. One was that, A, you, you were still processing it, of course. Yeah. But the second was that there was a profound lesson mm -hmm. somewhere there because yeah. of the pause you took and the way that you looked at the floor. And But when every other topic, you were like illuminated is sure. the best way to describe sure, it. Sure, sure. You see what I mean? So Yeah, I think one of the things that it, it taught me 17 years ago was that my dad also felt larger than life. I don't know if your father felt that way, feels that way as well. Yeah. But he felt yeah. larger than life. He was extremely intelligent and smart. He was very charismatic. He was resourceful, talented. He was he became he was a big lover. He loved people and he gave his heart in a big way after this transformation. And he cared deeply about relationships. Like I witnessed things he did that brought smiles to people's faces all the time, which is probably a lot of things that I've like translated in my own life. But one of the things that taught me was that if this can happen to a guy who feels larger than life in a moment when he was on vacation with his then uh, you know partner at the time, not my mother, they got divorced. 
but they were on vacation having a great time, if this can happen in a moment, at any time, then it brought so much urgency to my life to make sure I pursue the things that really are meaningful to me. And for years, there were things that I had to do that I wasn't like loving. I had to work really hard to get to that place. When I was broke and had no money on my sister's couch, it wasn't like this all just unfolded perfectly. It was years of effort, work, late nights, all that stuff. But it made me just say, what is my mission? What is my intention for this season of my life? And am I doing everything in my power to live the way I wanna live? Because if it could be over in a moment, I gotta shift my attention to things that really matter. And so that was a big powerful shift for me. And when he passed last month, it made it even clearer. You know, there's so many opportunities for someone like yourself and myself at this stage of our life and our careers. And a lot of opportunities can seem incredible. Here's a big money making opportunity. Here's a cool project I can do with someone. Here's these things that are coming my way. But if it's not aligning to my mission of something greater, if it's not aligning to my ultimate level of joy and authentic power, then should I be doing it right now? If it was all over in a day, in a month, in a year, is this something I would say yes to? And so it's just bringing me closer to that awareness that how it could all be over in a moment. And it brings the energy back to like my relationship with my girlfriend. I'm like, if it was over tomorrow, am I doing and saying what I need to say today? And that's been a powerful thing for me. There's a real, I mean, I always reflect on this, that Brony Ware, who was the palliative nurse who interviewed people on, in their last days and the retrospective clarity mm -hmm. people must have in their last days about what they did and didn't do yeah. right is, is so, so empowering. But as you say there, one of the things that terrifies me is my dad is ill. Mm. He's like not in good health and he's, he's outlived his siblings mm. and his life, if you look at it in any kind of comparative measure was way more stressful than them and his brother died of a heart attack mm. and his brother died younger than he is now. So this thing is haunting me almost in the back room. And the haunting thing is like, what should I be doing now? My relationship with my dad isn't particularly strong. Um, mm. You know what I mean? How often do you see him a year? <sighs> Three, Three, four times. Okay. Yeah. This is my friend Jesse Etzler made this example one time to me uh, and to like the audience. And he said, uh, and his father just passed away actually a couple weeks ago. And he said, my, my parents are old. They're in their 80s or something like that. And, um, you know, maybe they have five or 10 more years, but it's really five or 10 more times with them if you only see them once or twice a year. Yeah. It's not five or 10 Crazy. years. If you see them two, three times a year, Maybe you have three times if it's a year. Maybe you have 10 times if it's That's four crazy. years that you experienced a moment in person with your dad. Yeah. Hopefully he lives 10, 20 years, but two, three times a year is really 20 times left with your dad. And when we put it in, I just got chills thinking about that. Yeah, when we put it in perspective like that, are we giving as much as we could to the relationship? Are we opening up and healing certain things that maybe aren't, aren't healed yet? Are we having the conversations that are unspoken? And I think, um, I feel like I did the best of my abilities to do that with where he was at emotionally and mentally. And I would encourage you or anyone listening or watching to, to ask themselves on a scale of one to 10, how's my relationship with my father, my mother? And if it's not above a seven right now, what can you do? Not about them, even if they're the parent. What can you do to reach out and communicate? How can you take responsibility for your part of that relationship? And you just never know in any moment. What if someone sat listening to this now and they think, well, my parents or my dad or my mom or whatever was abusive or toxic yeah. or whatever to me? Is I think you got to ask yourself, if they died today, would I be happy with how I communicated, how I showed up? And maybe that means you need to disown your parents for a season of life because you're not able to get along. But are you still happy if you did that with everything you tried to do from a loving, calm, healed place? It's your healing journey. It's not about what they do or what they didn't do. It's about your healing journey. And I look at it as a gift from everything I experienced from my childhood. You know, I don't look at it as a painful thing anymore. You know, I'm not living in fear from the memories of my past anymore. I look at it as, God, I'm so grateful that I grew up feeling insecure, unlovable, and really dumb because I care deeply about loving other people. I care deeply about 
being a good listener and showing people how much I care. Mm. I care deeply about wisdom and knowledge in a different way, not just from school and books, but from interactions with human experiences, adventure, learning new skills and hobbies, and just progressing as a human. And I think, you know, even from the sexual abuse, I'm not mad at it anymore. I'm not hurt by it anymore. I hope it never happens to anyone in the history. I don't wish it on anyone. But I also know that it gave me an incredible gift because I've healed from it. I've taken my power back from that. And I know that it's benefited me now because I've rewritten the story about what it means about me. And I think if we can rewrite those stories in an empowering way, then we are not powerless, we're powerful. Mm. To that point of your healing journey there, mm -hmm. you describe your life in these three sort of sections, right? You've got the... I think it's the the preteens, yeah, and then it's like the teen to twenty two, and then it's the oh, is it four, and then the twenties, and then the thirties, yeah. right? Yeah, the twenties phase, as I read it, as I read through the whole, all the experiences on your, you know, your <laughs> sister's sofa, the LinkedIn yeah. stuff you'd done, felt a little bit like you were finding yourself a little yeah, bit, yeah, of course, right? yeah, and then post thirties, it's it feels like the work really started to begin. I mean, thirty is when everything started to change because that's the moment I allowed myself to be vulnerable for the first time. I just thought I had it figured out. And what I realized is I knew nothing. There were symptoms of an internal conflict that suggested 100%. to you that you didn't have it figured out. Of course, yeah. What I was, were the symptoms of that? I mean, <laughs> I mean, getting in fist fights on a basketball court in a, in a pickup game that's supposed to be fun and, and reacting so much to someone jabbing me, you know, in the ribs or, or, or smack talking me, talking bad or just like talking trash and being so reactive. Just explosive, it, like your father? So explosive, yeah, extremely explosive. Again, it was more of like, I didn't heal a lot of things from my childhood. It wasn't like one thing from my dad or the sexual abuse. It was kind of like the entire childhood. All the stories and all the examples that made me feel like I'm not lovable or I'm someone to be taken advantage of was still inside of me. And so it wasn't just one thing or one experience. It was all of it that was building a case for me to be reactive and explosive and feel like, uh, you know, the, the world was just out to get me or something. And when I learned the art of emotional regulation, that's when everything started to change. And I learned a part of that at 30 until 37. But in intimate relationships, I still hadn't learned how to fully love and honor my authentic power. I still gave in because I deeply wanted people to like me. I deeply wanted the person that I was giving my heart to, to love and accept me. And yet I was choosing people based on a wound still from my parents, from my mom, you know, giving in, from my mom not feeling probably loved and accepted and kind of repeating that pattern of her with my dad. I was finding partners like that. And I was taking on the mother role like kind of what my mom was taking on. And I was giving in. I watched her give in over and over and over to my dad and never stand up for who she truly was. You know, on, this is all unconscious. It wasn't until about a year ago when I started to learn this and process it. So I was choosing partners that after a period of time, they would get upset at me over and over of lots of different things. They just weren't happy with who I was or the actions or decisions or things I did in my business or whatever. Whatever it was that made them feel like they were insecure or something. Same. And so I would say, okay, I'll, I'll change this to make you happy. Okay, you don't like me doing this? Okay, I'll stop doing this. Okay, you don't like me salsa dancing? You don't like me traveling? You don't like me speaking? You don't like me doing, it. okay. Like whatever's gonna make you happy because there was love there. And I thought that when you love someone, you'll do whatever you can to make that love stay, to make it last. And so I would give and give and give up who I was in order to create peace and love. And what I was doing was creating incredible pain, resentment, and anger and frustration with inside of me of the person, of the relationship, and of myself. Because you were abandoning yourself. So abandoning myself over and over again. And I didn't know how to say no and how, how to be around someone who was unhappy with me in intimacy. I could do this in business and friends, but in intimacy, when there was love, I didn't know how to say no. And so I just gave in to create peace. 
And what I realized is that, you know, I was looking to create, to buy peace by abandoning myself, but you can't buy peace. We must be peace. And if someone is okay with that, great. And if they're not, then maybe you're not in alignment and that's okay. But I was not willing to let go of the feeling of love. It was a false love. It wasn't authentic love because authentic love is accepting the person for who they are and them accepting you for who mm -hmm. you are. It's not trying to change the person. If you're trying to change someone, you shouldn't be with them. We should be elevating each other to grow. But if there are fundamental things about you that I don't like, mm. and I'm trying to change you, why am I in a relationship with you? Go find someone that you don't need to change and vice versa. And so my girlfriend, Martha, I was like, listen, we started dating and I'd done months of this healing work and finally started the process and feel this inner peace. I said, listen, I'm gonna be 100% authentic to who I am. I'm going to obnoxiously be myself around you. And I'm letting you know, I wanna, I wanna be so obnoxiously myself that I, I hope you run away. I hope you run away because I'm never gonna change. I'm not gonna change for you or anyone else. I'm going to evolve. I'm gonna constantly improve, grow. I want you to be willing to give me feedback, but I'm not gonna change of something you're unhappy about, about me. Here are my values. Here's my vision. Here's my lifestyle. This is what I'm gonna be doing. I'm not gonna change this stuff. Just letting you know. And uh, it's been a beautiful journey because it's amazing to, to see what it's like having authentic trust and someone receiving you for 100% who you are and feeling like I can be myself. I've never felt this until now. It's beautiful. It's such a important conversation. Because it's crazy, man. You, you, talk, you described the reasons why in your trauma that, that made you a people pleaser. And do you know what's really interesting is when you told me that you were a people pleaser, um, I couldn't believe that. I'm like, what, you big tough athlete man? <laughs> people pleaser, Care, yeah. you know what I mean? But mm -hmm. it just, it goes to show that that sort of, that trauma in us yeah. um, is kind of agnostic to, to, to our mask or our, Absolutely. you know, set. And I, when you told me that, because we had a little bit of this conversation, just a hint oh. of it in, in, when we met in Dubai, I realized that I'd been a people pleaser, really? but I never thought I was. In all of my relationships, I think the significant reason why they failed is exactly what you've described. I've gone in trying to compromise everything. Really? And, and, oh my For God. For love. My just to keep God. the peace, keep the love. Just to, just to keep them and try and keep them happy yeah. um, with me. And in the short term, that day, fine. You go, any kind of mid to long term time no, horizon, it, and it's resentment, it's, it's exhausting, anger, exhaustion, it's a, arguments, it's a weight, a weight, so exhaustion, man. You know, I take full responsibility for every relationship I've chosen and been in and stayed in, because I could have gotten out of any relationship at any moment, but I was afraid and I lacked the, really, the self confidence to step away because I was afraid of losing love. Mm. But it's not real love if it's inauthentic. If you're having to change who you are to make someone happy, I just don't feel like that's real love. I'm all for making adjustments and alignment with certain things, but it shouldn't be changing your core essence of who you are to make someone happy. That's not real love. You said something to me which um, really puzzled me because I've never heard it before, which was when I said, um, I started talking to you about what things I should be compromising in my relationships and you went, no compromise. I mean, for me, I don't believe in compromising who I am. Yeah. If you're like, listen, this week I want to go to this place for a restaurant and next week you can choose. That's, I guess, a compromise of like activities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But not yeah. compromising your core values and your authentic power. If we are compromising our authentic selves, we are essentially saying, screw you to our creator. You've created us for who we are. And no, nah, I don't want to be this way for one human being because it doesn't make them feel good or it makes them unhappy or they're afraid or scared. As opposed to who can I be if I'm 100% myself in life? And I'm not saying like, if you've got flaws, adjust those, improve those. Like I'm all willing to improve and adjust all my flaws. But if it's something that's at my core is my personality, I'm not changing for anyone. Why? I want to be changing for one person that just doesn't seem like a good, I don't know, situation. And I've done it for too long. And with, with Martha, your current partner, yeah. um, you had a conversation very early on about your <laughs> unwillingness to compromise your core values. Yes. 
And my priorities. And your priorities. Yes. So, <laughs> so tell me exactly what you mean by your priorities yes. and how that was received. Man, I told her probably like three months in, as we, I knew in the first night I met her, I go, I wanted to be single. I was like, just got done this healing journey, get out of a relationship. I was like, I really want to be single for like a year and just be single. And I met her before that time. And I remember thinking, oh crap, there's something unique and special here on a different level, more than just sexual attraction. There's a spiritual connection. There's something deeper that I can see a vision of something incredible that I couldn't do on my own, right? And I was like, well, let me just string this along as far as I can before I get committed, right? Let me just give it some space, not jump into this thing too fast. Like, let's just take it slow. And after about three months, I said to her, I go, listen, I'm gonna tell you something that I don't think you're gonna like. And I said this many times to her. I go, I'm gonna say something right now that you're probably not gonna like. And I don't think any woman wants to hear this from a man. I'm just letting you know. And she's thinking I'm about to drop a bomb or something. And I'm like, you may not wanna continue dating me after you hear this. She's like, what is it? You know, she's freaking out. I go, you will never be my number one priority. Never. <laughs> and I had an explanation. I said, listen, my number one priority needs to be my health. Because without my health, I can't fully show up for my number two priority, which is my mission or my calling from God. Oh, God, you wasn't even number two, Lewis. And I said, you're not number one and you're not number two. You're number three. And no woman wants to hear, I'm the third priority in some man's life. They need to make me number one. I need to be thinking, they need to be thinking about me all the time. I'm number one priority, otherwise I'm out of here. And it's not that she's not a number one top priority, but health needs to come first at all times. That doesn't mean all day I'm doing my health. It's just, I need to make sure every day I'm taking care of it, this is a top priority. If this is number two, number three, number 10, I'm not gonna be good for you in our relationship. I'm not gonna have energy. I'm gonna be more moody. So I need to make this a priority first for the second priority, which is my mission, my calling from God, the universe, the world, whatever you wanna call it, whatever's speaking through me into the existence. Because if that is not a high priority for me, then I'm gonna be unhappy because I'm gonna feel like there's something calling me in the world and I'm not doing it because I'm giving more time and attention to one person. But if I'm healthy and working on myself, if I am putting energy and time into my mission, then you're gonna have the most incredible relationship of your life because I'm gonna be of service to you in such a high, beautiful, authentic way that you're gonna be feeling like you're the number one priority. Mm. But you just have to be in awareness that this is where I'm coming from. And it doesn't mean I'm not gonna be spending all my time with you and I'm free and, all, and we're not gonna have an amazing life, but you gotta be aware this is my priorities. And the crazy thing is, right when I finished, she said, that's the most amazing thing I've ever heard because that's exactly what I've been looking for. I've been dating guys with no purpose. None of them had a purpose, they made me their purpose. And I was like, no, what's the thing you wanna do in the world? What's the calling you have? And none of them had a calling. They had stuff, activities, they had hobbies, but it wasn't like a main calling in the world. And she was like, you're the perfect match for me because you have a mission to serve the world. And I'm cool with that. Were you trying to scare her off based I was. on a previous relationship? I was trying to scare her off by saying, I'm never gonna change who I am. Based on a previous relationship? Based on five previous relationships. Right. It was based on every relationship before where I abandoned myself to try to make one person happy and create peace in an environment because there was never peace. And it's my responsibility. It was my decisions by choosing these relationships, by staying and by not leaving sooner. And so it's never, because I just wanted to fix the relationship. I was like, okay, how can we make this better? What mask have I got to wear? Exactly. Yeah. And so, man, it's, it's liberating and freeing. And the only way this works is because, this sounds bad. I want to say something that probably sounds bad. I, th I think my girlfriend would be okay with me saying this, but... The only way this works is I'm willing to walk away at any moment. I don't wanna walk away. I wanna be with this woman. She's incredible. She's a gift in my life. But if it's not in alignment with her values, her vision, her lifestyle, my values, my vision, my lifestyle, and we don't fully accept who we are, 
then we shouldn't be together. Mm -hmm. And I want the best for her and I want the best for me. So as sad as I would be, I'm willing to walk away at any moment if it compromises giving up who I am. Mm -hmm. And it brings me peace because I'm not attached. Mm -hmm. I'm committed, I'm holding it loosely. You know, I've I'm, I'm got my hands wrapped around the relationship, but I'm not suffocating the relationship. I'm not squeezing it to death. I'm like, okay, you mm -hmm. can. You want it, you don't need it. Yeah, I want it. I'm committed. I'm all in, but I'm not going to change who I am yeah. to force it. I had a few words to say about one of my sponsors on this podcast. My girlfriend came upstairs yesterday when I was having a shower and she said to me that she tried the Huel Protein Shake, which lives on my fridge over there. And she said, it's amazing. Low calories, you get your 20 odd grams of protein, you get your 26 vitamins and minerals, and it's nutritionally complete. In the protein space, there's lots of things, but it's hard to find something that is nice, especially when consumed just with water, and that is nutritionally complete, and that has about 100 calories in total, while also giving you your 20 grams of protein. If you haven't tried the Huel Protein product, do give it a try. The salted caramel one, if you put some ice cubes in it and you put it in a blender and you try it, is as good as pretty much any milkshake on the market, just mixed with water. It's been a game changer for me because I'm trying to drop my calorie intake and I'm trying to be a little bit more healthy with my diet. So this is where Huel fits in my life. Thank you, Huel, for making a product that I actually like. The salted caramel is my favorite. I've got the banana one here, which is the one my girlfriend likes, but for me, salted caramel is the one. When you talk about priorities, I was trying to, in my head, think of a, a use of words that might be more um, <laughs> received better. And I, the, it's funny, because I was thinking about this table. I was thinking there's, this table was, where we are now has two levels, right? Mm -hmm. The first foundation of this table you could call health, right? Without that, nothing else can sit on the table. The yeah. second foundation could be mission. And then the relationship sits on top of both. Mm. And it's it's enabled by the foundation of my, my health and my mission. Absolutely, man. I think if you kind of flip it, it kind of sounds better. Like, so, but I was thinking, <laughs> put the, you like, because effectively you're putting your health at the bottom, <laughs> which is, yeah. well, it's also still your foundation. But I completely get that because at any time in my life where I've abandoned my my sense of mission, I can only do that for a short period of time. Absolutely. I can only fake that before I start to lose orientation in my mind. And, and you resent yourself. You resent, resent the person, you the resent person, the relationship, yeah. and you're like, you're not in love as much with the relationship because you feel like you're not, it's not lifting you to your highest calling. Amen. And I think the beautiful thing about Martha and our relationship, I think she'd be open with me talking about this, but every relationship I've been in, I was like, I wonder what it would be like to start therapy in the beginning when everything is perfect. So with Martha, I said in the beginning, I said, listen, I'm doing therapy every two weeks. I did this for the last year on my own individually. I'm gonna be doing it for this next year and years. Just as emotional accountability for myself in life, business, friends, family, like anything I need to process, it's just good for me to clean the energy and not let things pile up. And I said, I'd love for us, and she was doing this individually. I said, I'd love for us to do this together as we start to develop our relationship when things are great and actually see if we are in alignment. And so two weekends ago, we did a five hour session together with my therapist talking about expectations, agreements, values, dreams, vision, and just processing anything we needed to process. And it was such a powerful experience that when things are going good, to continue to talk about vision casting, what we wanna to build together, not when things are going bad. And it's really to talk about things that maybe we haven't fully been comfortable talking about yet and putting it out there, as opposed to hiding things or waiting for things to come out later. And it was such a powerful five hour experience. I mean, it's very emotional and you're processing a lot and we're, we're diving in deep exercises, eye gazing, talking about things like it's an emotional, relationship workout. Yeah. You'll save a lot of time and headache by going to therapy when things are great as opposed to when things are bad. It's like that prevention versus reacting prevention, to man. once it's reared as ugly yeah. head and there's been some bust up. You go to the gym, not because you're sick, but because you're healthy, yeah. to stay healthy. To stay healthy, yeah. You know, not when, not when you're wait to get sick, now I need to go to the gym. Yeah, yeah. And I think, who does that in relationships? I don't know anyone who's done that. You hear people say like before marriage, we do like a, a premarital maybe, relationship training with mm. the churches or like a therapist, but that's after a few years usually. I just wanted to experiment. I have no idea where it's gonna go, but I feel like mm, something's, something's happening underneath the surface 
by both of us doing this together when things are good. Men just don't do this stuff, Lewis. I'm thinking about my guy friends and I, I can imagine some hesitancy towards oh, them. 100%. Because they just not, it's all the things you've described, that they've worn a mask of toughness. We put the, we keep the emotions in the back room. You know what I mean? And, and also, do you know yeah. what, do you know what as well? Guys don't love conflict. With yeah, their, with, it's not fun, with, man. So they would probably see that as, oh my God, I'm going to get told off. Exactly. Oh my God, oh, she's going to give me shit for that thing I Dude, do. it's so hard, man. What you've described there, that doing the, making the roots go deeper. Mm -hmm. it, again, something it's I have to, to thank do, you man. for, because yeah. we had a conversation about vision, values, and lifestyle. Mm. And when I go back from Dubai- How'd it go? Yeah, 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 so you know what I'm gonna say, yeah. I had a conversation with my girlfriend and she was all for it. So we really? sat on that table there and I said, I spoke to Lewis and he, he talked about vision, values and lifestyle. So we sat there one night on the weekend, lit a candle, we were making some mm. like pottery stuff. Mm. And we said, after we've done this, we'll just write down our visions, values and lifestyle wow. and we'll go through them one one by one. Gosh, so like I beautiful. speak on one, you speak on one. That's beautiful, and it, it took about three hours that's and incredible. there were tears. Oh my gosh. There were moments of joy. But, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. powerful. but the conclusion was exactly what you've described. There was all these little things. I'll give you some detail. Give it to me. How we, when we go to sleep at night, I like to go to sleep a certain way. So I like something playing. She likes silence. Oh. But you and hadn't talked about it probably. Hadn't talked about it. Wow. And it was one of the things just about like our sleep routine. We're obviously gonna have to sleep in bed for many, many years. And we hadn't discussed it. And I knew it was conflict. I was getting in bed and knowing if I play this, she's not gonna be happy, but she might not say anything. Ah. And so just talking it through and going, look, but babe, the reason why I listen to something when I go to sleep is because I've had 29 years of doing that. When I lived in the countryside in Plymouth, I had a radio in my room and the, the kid in me found comfort in hearing a voice when I went to yeah. sleep. You've had 29 years of doing it another way. We've got to ask ourselves, is it really a problem? Mm. And we and that was the discussion. Like, is it a problem? If I say, if I put an AirPod in, because I'm not going to compromise. Right. I, and if you, you know, you wouldn't even hear it. Is it really a problem? And then, then we discussed why she thought it might be a problem. Does that impact our intimacy? Wow. What intimacy is a separate, you know? And eventually we came to this conclusion and it's not an issue anymore. And it was an issue in our, our relationship for about wow. a year. It was that niggling wow. little, you could feel the contempt and resentment slowly building. And you guys were and long distance gone. too, right? We were long so, distance, yeah. So it wasn't like- You weren't sleeping with that. It wasn't every 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 no. day for months. No. So you were like a couple weeks at a time yeah, in yeah. space. Yeah. But when you're gonna be more together consistently, yeah. it could be a problem. Yeah. That's wow. one of a list of about 30 things wow. that, that we, we addressed and worked through. And more than anything, coming out the end of that exercise, which is something I've never done with any partner mm. I've ever had. I've never even had the conversation. You just crack on. don't think on. about these no, things. No, you don't. I didn't learn this until like <laughs> yeah. two years ago, man. Yeah, you just, just, you just get, get on with life, right? You just try to keep having fun experiences. And avoid- Conflict. The conflict. I've had so many uncomfortable conversations with, with Marta that it's like a muscle. You gotta practice it. And every time an uncomfortable conversation comes up, I have to breathe. I'm like, oh man. I feel tense and anxious. Yeah, I don't want to do it. I don't like it. I don't think anyone likes it. But the more we do it, is here's the thing. We've created a safe space where, and the reason I don't like to do it or haven't liked to do it until now is because every time I would have an uncomfortable conversation before, the partner I had could not handle it. Mm. So I'd say, here's how I'm feeling and they couldn't handle it or there'd be an explosion or a reaction or something. So it didn't make me feel safe to have mm. the uncomfortable conversation. So I'd avoid it. Amen. And with Marta, I said to her, listen, like the first uncomfortable conversation I go, <clears throat> she asked me a question about something that was kind of like, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I remember being like, hmm, should I tell her the truth or should I <laughs> kind of a little bit of the truth, you know? And I go, do you want me to be 100% honest with you? And she said, yes, always. I go, are you sure you want me to be 100% honest? She said, yes. And I go, okay, let me ask you one more time. And the reason I'm asking you is because I've never met someone who can hold the space for my honesty without screaming. reacting or crying or screaming or running away. So are you saying you're, you're emotionally available to hold the space for my honesty and truth? And she said, yes, I'm a grown woman. I go, interesting, okay. Well, here it is. And she was like, thank you for your honesty. And it built a one step. Okay, let me try this again one more time and make sure she can really handle it. And the more steps of her holding space for my honesty, my vulnerability and not exploding or reacting makes me feel like, okay, I can say anything. And it, she may not like it, 
it may be uncomfortable, but she's not explosive. And that's a powerful thing of how can I be comfortable in the discomfort while also feeling safe? Amen. That's huge. Amen. And you've got to learn to practice that yourself in a relationship and not be reactive. If a partner is telling you stuff about their past you don't like or what they did or this and that, you've got to be okay and practice it. And they've got to be. And that's where constantly working on yourself is huge in intimacy and relationships. And if one person's doing that and the other person isn't, there's going to be conflict. Yeah. Do you have a trainer when you work out? Yes. Have you had a business coach in the past or, yeah, ment or mentors? Yeah, so many. Would you stop getting coaching in business, even though you've no. been so successful? No. You wouldn't stop, even though you've got all this money mm. and businesses and mm. startups and investment, gosh, mm. you know, dragons then and all. <laughs> you keep hiring a coach or have a mentor 100%. in business. Why would we not do that for our emotions and our heart? Mm. It is the most powerful energy that we have, emotions and our heart. And yet... We have a stigma around having a coach or mentor or a guide or a therapist, whatever you want to call it, of emotional regulation and, and accountability. And people make so many mistakes in their lives by not having that regulated. Their reactions can have consequences for years. People go to prison for one reaction. People lose their entire business for one reaction. People lose their marriages because of one emotional reaction. This is one of the most powerful currencies in the world, in my opinion, is having power over your emotions. Not stuffing your emotions, not saying they don't exist, not acknowledging them, but expressing them in a healthy way and in a healthy environment. And when we learn that, and I've been learning that over the last couple of years, it's been an incredible shift in every area of my life. And I also just feel an incredible sense of peace. I'm not saying that I'm always gonna be perfect in the future around this, but showing up to someone twi twice a month and processing makes me a whole lot better. You've just reminded me of something that really stuck out to me when I first met you, yeah. was when we were sat there, and you're doing it again today, you've done it three times today, is you would say something and then you'd say, and that's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. So even when you were talking about previous relationships you've been in or whatever mm -hmm. else, you would not blame the other person. You would like mm -hmm. aggressively not blame them in a, in a really remarkable way. So you'd say, mm -hmm. this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, yeah. where any other human being I've ever met was, was in their right to attribute the blame to the other person. And you would mm -hmm. always end the sentence, as you've done three times today, with, and that's on me, or, and that's my responsibility. Yeah. Why? Because I chose it. I chose those experiences. I chose those relationships. I chose the environment. I chose those people. I chose to stay. And it's my responsibility on how I show up and how I react, how I respond and how I stay or leave. But even when someone was toxic or whatever to you, you say that was on me. It's my responsibility because if someone does that and I stay with them, that's on me. That's me not standing up for myself. That's me abandoning myself. That's not on them. They're living their life. They're doing what they do naturally. It didn't line up with me, but I stayed. So that's on me. I can't expect someone else to change. I can't expect someone else to respect my values, my vision, and my lifestyle. They have theirs, and they're showing it through their actions and their behaviors. And so for me, if I'm able to witness that and be aware and not have the false sense of love and be attached to the false sense of love that I'm feeling, I'm having this feeling about this person, and I want to get back to this healthy environment with this person, I gotta learn to let that go. And that's why I say I can hold love in my hands loosely, committed and excited about it. But if it's not meant for me, I shouldn't hold on to it and abandon myself. And I think I did that too many times. So that's 100% my responsibility. Can you run me through then? Because I know there's gonna be people that, people listening to this that I've just had, we've both done this exercise and it was amazing. Yes. And they're, gonna, they're now thinking, what is the values yeah. part? What is the vision part? What's the lifestyle part? Yeah, I think the values is really about well, for, the, for me, the values is like, okay, I value health in my life. I'm, I'm going to be focused on my health. I value my mission, my team, my business. Like that's a conscious mission. I value spending time with friends. I value all my hobbies and activities. That's salsa dancing. That's traveling. That's all these different things I enjoy doing. I value conscious conversations. 
Like I want to have conscious conversations. I can't have superficial conversations. I literally met someone this morning before I came here um, who is a part of a big company here in, in London. And within two minutes, I probably like shouldn't do this, but I don't know if all British people are this way and it's not a bad thing, but it's very good with like surface talk. You know? yeah. <laughs> oh, how was, your, how was the flight? And uh, let's, the let's order some tea and crumpets or whatever it is, you know? And it's like, <laughs> which is fine, but I just can't handle it after a few minutes. So right away, I, I'm the person sitting next to me. I was like, how's your marriage? You know, <laughs> I just asked, I was just like, I was, how long have you been married for? You know, and she was like, oh, I've been married for like six years. And I go, what's three questions you wish you would have asked? I literally did this. I go, what's three questions you wish you would have asked the day before you got married that you didn't ask? Because I'm just fascinated by people. You know, I'm curious. I'm like, how amazing has the marriage been? How has it been? Has it been healthy? Have you had challenges? Is there anything you wish you would have changed or talked about sooner? And right away, she's like opening up and yeah. like being vulnerable. And I was like, sorry to put this on you right now, but I'm just <laughs> fascinated because I want to learn from everyone. And um, so I was like, I want to have conscious conversations. It's one of my values. So we have these deep, intimate talks all the time. And so I write down a list of all my values. The vision is, this is the vision for my personal life. So personally, I want to be working out. I'm going to be healthy as an individual. My vision is my, my mission, which is building a conscious business to serve millions of people, to help them improve the quality of their life. And I, this is a major priority to me. This is my one and two priority. This is my vision. And also our relationship vision, which I think is extremely important to talk about with your partner. Here's the vision I have for our relationship for these, these couple of years and for the future. This is what I see with flexibility, nothing set in stone, but this is what I see. What is your vision for our relationship? Because maybe her or his vision is different. One person wants to have kids, the other person doesn't. One wants to get married, the other doesn't. One wants an open relationship, the other one doesn't want that. One wants their family around every weekend. The other one's like, I don't want to be around your family every weekend. Mm. So what is the vision of our shared relationship? And then lifestyle. I love, you know, traveling. Do you like to travel? I love to watch these types of movies. I like to eat these types of foods. I like these types of experiences. This is a lifestyle that I live. If you have a completely different lifestyle, that's going to be hard for us. If you like to do none of those things, if you like to stay at home every day where I want to go out and network with people and travel, that's just going to be a tough, we're going to be butting heads a lot. And there might be, maybe it works, but it might cause some friction and distance in the future. So are we in alignment of values, vision, and lifestyle? It doesn't have to be 100% perfect, but is there alignment in each category? And I think the more alignment you have, the more potential for a better, healthier relationship. And on things like work, this is obviously a big one for ambitious people. Uh -huh. When they... um when they're running a business, they're career driven, they're vision or mission driven, and they have a partner. I want to know from a work perspective, what kind of conversation you've had with Martha uh -huh. and vice versa, because I know you're a guy that travels a lot, does a lot of speaking, mm -hmm. is very, you know, in pursuit of yourself and your potential. So how do you then balance like being a, a boyfriend, being present, going on dates and stuff? What's the conversation? When I first met her, I said, one of my values is alone time. Like that's one of my values of as well, is having alone time, having enough space in our home so that I can go into a room and do what I wanna do and watch sports or chill and you can do what you wanna do and I feel like we have space. Doesn't mean I don't wanna be around her all the time, but I also value my space and alone time and so does she. So it's having those conversations. And with, with business, I said, listen, if you can come on any trip, like you're more than welcome to come, I'd love for you to come. But she's doing her own thing. She's traveling as well, back and forth from Atlanta. So. Um, and she'll be filming two movies later this year and gone for two months at a time. So I'll need to travel at those times and she'll travel with me. And that's the season of our life right now. And you're, you're anticipating another season at some point, I imagine. At some point, yeah. I mean, it may evolve, may change into family and all these other things. So it's like when that season happens, there may be less travel for her. How do you know? feel about that? About what? About the next season of family. Because <laughs> there's a smirk on your face, which is- <laughs> Well, I, I, this is something that I say to her. I go, listen, I'm really intentional about building a deep, strong foundation. Let's keep building the strong foundation and everything else will follow. If I feel a sense of peace, I feel a sense of safety in this relationship, just like you, mm. 
then all these other things are going to happen naturally. And they'll probably happen fast naturally once we both have a deeper foundation and just experience life more. So have you historically had a commitment challenge? hundred percent, man. hundred percent. Well, actually, Does it I haven't had scared? a commitment challenge because I've always been committed. I've been in very long-term committed relationships. Interesting. But I've had a commitment challenge in seeing around family and kids because I never trusted the person I was with fully. So I couldn't see myself having kids with them. And I kept waiting to see something to shift to where I felt like, and this was kind of where my head would go. This is maybe weird, but I would say, if something ever happened to me, could I trust this person would take care of my kids? And I just never felt that because I never felt like I could trust them with me. Like again, I take full responsibility and accountability because I chose people that didn't accept me fully, that weren't happy with who I was. And so that's on me. And I never felt like I could go to the next level with any of them because I was like, something's off inside. And I feel like uh, I'm changing who I am to make them happy and they're still not happy. So I can't have kids with, I can't see myself living like this for you know 20 years with someone, so. And that kind of trauma, that niggle, is, oh, is that still inside you there somewhere? As you think about I this? Don't, I think it was in the first maybe few months of us dating but I don't feel like it is anymore. Yeah, I feel like every day I create more and more peace mm. and connection and safety. And she's just an incredible person. Like she's just a great human being and trustworthy. And so it's like, even if something happened to me, she could be an incredible, you know, incredible mom, so. Of all the things you've learned from your good and bad relationships, if you were to have, if I had to, if I said to you that, what is the single biggest killer of relationships, what would your answer be? Uh, I would say the biggest killer of relationships is being out of integrity with your authentic power and abandoning yourself to create peace in the relationship. Because if one person's doing that or two people are doing that, there's some type of codependency, there's some type of wound on why we're doing that that's creating that. So for me, the biggest killer is not healing. That's the biggest killer. Whatever wounds we have, be on the healing journey. It's not, a, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's not like a moment, it's a journey of healing. And I think um, the more people are willing to dive into their heart and their emotions and whatever insecurities, wherever they feel triggered, that's where you need to lean into because that trigger is gonna come up in a relationships big time if you haven't healed it. So it's the emotional healing, I think is one of the most powerful things. It's funny, I interviewed a brain surgeon who'd done over a thousand brain surgeries and studied the brain. And he's also a PhD in neuroscience. So he studies the mind and thoughts and he was a brain surgeon. And I said, what's the number one skill you feel like human beings should learn to master? And his answer was beautiful. He said, emotional regulation. I was like, I 100% agree. Because if we don't have the power to regulate our feelings around a situation, an environment, something that happens in events, then that event has power over us as opposed to us over that moment. And if it has power over us to where we react so strongly, we need to ask ourselves, why am I so triggered? Where is that wound? That's a wound somewhere. Where is that wound? And how can I start the healing journey? I'm not saying that things are going to happen in life and you're never going to feel something, but just not react and be overwhelmed emotionally to where it takes you away from love and takes you away from your mission. But if something is so strong that it causes you to lose sleep for three days or causes you to react in a negative way, it's pulling you away from your heart, from love, and from your meaningful mission. I think we just got to get back to, okay, why is it stressing me out? How can I process this and integrate healing in a healthy way so that when life happens, it doesn't pull me off my mission? And that's something I've experienced for the first time in the last three months is really like life has happened in a big way for me. It's sidetracked me a little bit, but it's not pulling me off. Like I'm, I'm needing to face it and deal with things and process but it's not like defeating me to where I feel like I'm exhausted. Mm. And that's because I'm holding myself emotionally accountable and doing the work. 
if I if someone's listening to this and they don't have a therapist, they they don't have the resources or whatever uh -huh. to, to have therapy. How else can they go about developing the self awareness required for that emotional regulation mm. journey? There's definitely things you can do on your own. I would I would uh, read a book called How to Do the Work um, by uh, Nicole LaPera, which gives you a lot of exercises and practices and things like that on how to do the work yourself. So you can get the book for 25 bucks and, and start there and start your own ritual and healing process, whether it be journaling, whether it be, you know, other different types of meditations, things like that. They have, she has different rituals in there you can do. But I would recommend, I don't think there's anything more powerful than sitting in front of a human and talking to someone about how you feel and what you're going through. So whether that's a priest or a parent or a teacher or you know a friend that you trust, someone you feel like who has a little bit more wisdom than you, I would start there until you can afford the therapy. And in terms of emotional journeys, you cite that you're still on one. Absolutely. What are the things that you're now talking to your therapist about that you're trying to solve in yourself? I had this photo for the last year, and I'll just show the camera, the photo of my five-year-old self. And in the last session I did with her, it was all about um, healing the inner child, right? It was all about healing the inner child and doing the, the work. I mean, I did some weird stuff, like putting myself in spiritual and mental environments where I'm talking to my five-year-old self and looking at my five-year-old self, hugging my five-year-old self, integrating my five-year-old self with my adult self and kind of reparenting that psychological child. Mm. Some weird stuff, but for whatever reason, it's worked for me. Because now I can look at a situation and say, okay, do I feel triggered? Oh, where's that coming from? Is it from that hurt child? If so, all I need to do is have a conversation with that part of my mind and say, I'm an adult now and the adult is here and I got your back. I can take care of this. I know how to process and soothe things in a healthy way. I don't need to lean onto an addiction or a reaction or whatever it may be to process. I know how to handle this. I know how to breathe. I know how to get, take a walk. I know how to have a conversation and process. You're safe. You're okay. It's all going to be okay. Whereas before, I didn't have that ability to communicate with a wounded part of myself. Mm -hmm. And so now she said, we've healed the five-year-old version of you that was sexually abused because I don't get triggered by it. I don't get reactive to it. I'm not defensive and guarded anymore. And I'm also shifting the way I don't please people in relationships anymore. So I've done a lot of things to do the work about intimacy and relationships and just in life. She's like, now, and I go, okay, am I done? Cause this is a lot of work, you know? It's like, it's a lot. You're diving into your emotions. You're tapping into uncomfortable stuff. You're like crying. It's all these things. She's like, this is a journey. Do you want to go to the next level in your life? Or are you satisfied? I'm like, okay, you got to keep going, you know? There's always something else. And so she's like, we want to tap into the 11 to 12 year old self. And she's like, find a photo. I, that's my next homework is to put a photo of myself when I was 11 or 12 and start healing that part of my life. And there was a bunch of different stuff that happened in that phase that I haven't fully healed or forgiven myself. And so that'll be the next work to do. And it'll be like stages of life until I meet myself to where I am now. Interesting. And heal and, and working on the evolution of all the memories of the past that wrote a story and developed chapters in a book that did not serve me. It's like a until, script, wasn't it? Yeah. And rewriting the script. Yeah, yeah. And not diminishing the things that happened, but acknowledging them and healing them in a different way and mm -hmm. processing it in a healthy way so that I can meet myself where I'm at now mm. and then really start elevating. How much has doing a podcast where you sit with these people, but also you reflect- changer, man. Yeah, right. It's a game changer, <laughs> I man. I get the biggest like neuroscience. I've had so many, and this year has been like the year of therapists and neuroscientists and spiritual gurus and just being like figuring out more and more about emotions, about regulation, about healing, about inner child work, because- I have people on there where I'm like, when I'm struggling in something in my life, I bring those people on. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, teach me how to like overcome this. Free you know? therapy, right? It's incredible. Yeah. And so my audience would be like, oh, Lewis is going through stuff in this. Oh, Lewis is going through a breakup. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lewis is in a relationship. Oh, Lewis is, you know. It's amazing. It's, well, the other thing that I am, um, I know a lot of people will 
will struggle with is the confidence to overcome some kind of fear. You talked a little bit there about our self story and how that limits us. One of the, the fears I know you had in your life, which is almost impossible to imagine based on the, the man you are sat in front of me today, was that fear of public speaking. Huge fear, man. And I could not stand in front of two to three peer friends in school and really even have a conversation. Like I didn't know how, to, if someone would ask me a question, I would get nervous. I couldn't even respond with really a small story. Just because I was so, the story I told myself that I was so used to being made fun of and picked on growing up that I would just didn't want to speak that much because I didn't want to be made fun of. I had a few words to say about one of my sponsors on this podcast. As you might know, Crafted are one of the sponsors of this podcast and Crafted are a jewelry brand and they make really meaningful pieces of jewelry. The really wonderful thing about Crafted jewelry is it's super affordable. It looks amazing. The pieces hold tremendous meaning and they are really well made. I think I've worn this piece for almost a year. It hasn't broken hasn't changed color because it's really, really good quality. And it costs roughly 50 quid. People will be surprised when they hear that. They'll probably assume that all of my jewelry is like solid gold and costs thousands and thousands of pounds. But what's the point when you can achieve the exact same effect from a piece of jewelry that's high quality and costs 50 quid? That's why I buy Crafted. To put it in context of where you are today, you're yeah. an international speaker. You're getting, honest, you're getting paid big six figure numbers mm -hmm. to speak once. Yeah. And I just want to put that in context because you went from someone that basically couldn't have a conversation <laughs> to now like an international public speaker. Yeah, I don't know if um, it was like this in school in the UK, but in America, at least in Ohio where I grew up, the teacher would sometimes say, okay, we're going to have you guys read aloud, right? And okay, Lewis, open up chapter one, paragraph one and stand up and read in front of people. And it got to the point where it was so terrifying because I would get up and I was not able to read until really about 10th grade, no joke. When I went into eighth grade, that private boarding school, they tested me reading and comprehension and everything and I had a second grade reading level. So when I was in school, it was so hard for me to stand in front of the class and read aloud because the simplest words, I didn't know what they were. What they were. It was dyslexic, so it was just challenging to read and then I'd feel nervous and then I would sabotage it and then kids would laugh because I couldn't read. And so it was just kind of like a traumatizing thing that I had to learn how to let go of and heal. And so I just never wanted to speak in front of people. And I remember, this is funny, I was also, um, <laughs> I was also terrified to dance. And I started salsa dancing obsessively because I wanted to overcome this fear. And when I was learning this skill of salsa dancing to overcome that fear, I met a guy who was a public speaker and he got paid to speak around the country. And I said, how do you do this? And he said, meet me tomorrow at this coffee shop and I'll, and I'll answer any question you have. Cause we're literally like in the middle of the dance floor and I'm asking <laughs> this. So I meet him at this coffee shop in Columbus, Ohio. And he was like, if you wanna overcome the fear of public speaking, you need to practice it every week. And I recommend joining this thing called Toastmasters where you can practice in a safe environment where they're not gonna laugh at you. And he said, go every week for a year and come back to me when you're done. And that's what I did. I went to a Toastmasters club every week for a year. And I remember it was terrifying for the first few months. But the more I did it and just messed up, I just kept messing up, but I found someone to mentor me there. I practiced it consistently every single week, my next speech. I would put myself in uncomfortable conversations to just be made fun of or just feel like I'm so stupid around these people. But every week I'd show up I would get a little bit more confidence, a little bit more confidence till the last week of the year. I remember I had no notes, no props, no nothing. And I was extremely poised and confident and got like this standing ovation at the end of the year because they saw my journey. The first speech, I had everything written out word for word. Word for word, I looked down at, behind a podium and read word for word. I didn't look up once on my first speech to the point where I was like, okay, I'm writing a speech and then looking up a couple times while reading it. To then it was like just note cards, to then it was bullet points, to then it was a slide, to then it was nothing. But it was mind blowing because it took a year to kind of get a baseline of confidence and it took every week showing up. But I'm telling you, if I could do something like this, it's possible, but you gotta be willing to be so uncomfortable to overcome these fears sometimes.
There's two things I was, I was reflecting on as you were speaking then. It's the first is how that you know, repetitions rewrites this new kind of subjective evidence yeah. about who we are and what we're capable of, which results in mastery. But it starts with repetition, which creates new evidence. And then you've got yeah. the, ma the mastery point. But also just that that wasn't just a lesson about public speaking. It's a general lesson about what happens when in life we, go, we arrive at the crossroads of fear. <laughs> And one side says, turn right to go back to comfort, which is never do this thing ever again because right, right. it's humiliating. And the other is like, it's the lights are off down that path, but it's like into the fear. And this happens every week in everyone's life, in your job, in your relationship, in someone offers you, oh, do you want to come and do this thing? And you go, oh, that's not yeah. I salsa dance. And or you go through a hard relationship and you're like, I can't open my heart up again exactly. to love. Yeah. Vulnerability. Um, but so evident in your story and even the fact that you write down your biggest fears every year, it's so clear that you continually chose to go into the fear and that resulted in tremendous growth. Yeah. It's and always, it's always. And the amount of confidence I have over the last 15, 20 years really, of just taking on these different fears that I thought I would never be able to do. Let's talk salsa dancing. You know, I started that 17 years ago. It's opened up a world to me. I've traveled the world. I've salsa danced in every major city around the world over the last 17 years. Wow. I've met incredible people. I have had so much fun. I get to just go and dance and have fun. Um, and it gives me an incredible sense. It's a tool that I can take out at any moment whenever needed. It's a language that I can speak to so many people that speak that language. And it's given me a level of confidence that I never had without that because it was a fear and now it's something that's fun that I've mastered. It's incredible. Same thing with public speaking. I remember thinking before I started Toastmasters, like if I wanna get a job, I need to learn public speaking. If I wanna like improve in the career that I go into, I need to be able to communicate in a boardroom and get my ideas across. Even if I'm an employee, I just need to be able to communicate. Or if I'm uh, a CEO one day, I need to be able to inspire. If I wanna be on stage, I need to be able to get a message across to influence and impact people. So I was like, if I wanna accomplish my dreams, I need to overcome this fear. And it's brought me so many opportunities because I spent a year obsessing over this and failing. Again, it's brought me incredible financial resources. It's put me in front of, it's, I've traveled the world because of speaking. It's brought me business deals. I've met and collaborated with other speakers that I met on stages at these events. It's given me confidence, you know, by having this skill. So every fear that I have, if I master it and I go all in on it, something magical and beautiful happens on the other side. Same in relationships. After the previous relationship, I was like, okay, I can be afraid and be single for a year and like guard my heart, or I can open my heart, keep it expansive, not closed off of the, after this pain and challenge, keep it open and see what's possible. And when I met her, I was thinking to myself, ah, I don't know if I wanna like go into this, but I was like, let me keep it open and explore. And it's been magic and beauty on the other side because I've gone all in that as well. Every time, it's just something magical happens. When I think about that crossroads analogy, where you've got, the, you arrive at the crossroads of fear and it says, turn right if you want to go back into certainty <laughs> and comfort, or turn left, it's dark in there. Yeah. And it goes, go into the fear and address it and work through it. I think the people, the reason why people turn right into certainty and to comfort, or really go back, right, is because they've miscalculated what the actual risk is. Mm -hmm. So in the case of, say, being vulnerable in your relationships, it seems like the, the, the low risk path 
is to like keep the mask on, just please them and whatever. Yeah. However, when you zoom out, that is the existential risk of the relationship mm -hmm. is faking and being inauthentic to yourself. Yeah. That was actually the risk. Absolutely. But people like, they miss, they don't know what the risk is. And generally in life, it's people, that when they say to me, oh, you're so courageous for dropping out of university and starting this business. I've reflected on that over the years and because I've really struggled with this concept of people thinking I was courageous. In my mind, the risk was staying in university, right. going into the corporate rat race and not pursuing myself and then having a midlife crisis when I'd abandoned right. myself. That was the risk. Yeah. The easy, cowardice thing to do was leaving university and pursuing myself. And I think the reframing of it yeah. is really probably the most potent way of getting people to understand that in fact, the dark left side of that fear crossroads is actually the least risky path to take mm -hmm. if you zoom out. Absolutely. And if you, you see the, what's on the other side. Yeah. yeah. What's possible for you, what's yeah. available on the other side. Yeah, exactly. Or even if you see what certainly and comfort will, will, exactly. will deliver you. You're, is, it's it's about having a short period of pain versus long period of pain. And exactly. the short pain is diving into the fear. Maybe the pain is a week, a month, or a year in order to overcome that fear mm. until you overcome it and transcend it. Or having this numbing low level pain for the rest of your life by not choosing that. Which one do you want? You know, for me, I just can't live that way. And it's not just a one, right? So if you if you if you fake it in work and then your relationships, then your friendships, then you're gonna have- And your health 10, and all this, yes. You're gonna have 10 loans. Exactly. Which is gonna, what happens then? Depression, yeah. crippling anxiety. Exactly. Panic attacks, all that stuff. Impulsive behavior, all these, you know, mm, addiction. Addictions, everything, man. As you look off into your future then, Lewis, and you're thinking about how Lewis Howes shapes his future, what he's pursuing, how he finds his meaning and happiness on an ongoing basis. What is the answer? Everything is based on mission. The, the mechanism is kind of irrelevant. How I do it is irrelevant. The mission is to serve 100 million lives weekly, to help them improve the quality of their life. That's the mission. That's your mission? That's the mission. That's been the mission for about eight years. It's been consistently that. Why 100 million? People ask me that. I think when I came up with that number, because I'd already impacted millions at the time. And whenever I ask people like, what's your dream? And they say they wanna change the world. It just doesn't seem real. Like, okay, what does that mean? And then some people say, I wanna change billions of lives. Okay. It just seems like it's hard to measure. It's hard to measure that quickly. Like how fast is that gonna happen? But I'd already impacted millions. And I was like, okay, what would it look like? How long would it take me to reach a hundred million people at once, like in a year? And then how could I, what would it look like to do it in a month and then in a week? And then how could I repeat that every week? What's the mechanism? Right now it's podcasting, YouTube, social media, books, events, all those different things. Maybe in the future there's another mechanism. For me, I'm not attached to the mechanism, I'm committed to the mission. And so I'm flexible and open on how. I wanna make sure that I'm a, a messenger and I'm a facilitator of messages with other messengers. And that's the mission for this season of my life. Until something shifts inside of me where it says, you know, that's not your calling anymore, then I'll listen to that next mission. Two questions then. The first question is, why does that matter to you? Why does helping 100 million lives a week matter to you? What are you gonna get if that happens, mm. if you succeed? Well, helping one person matters to me. When I wrote my book, The Mask of Masculinity, I remember thinking to myself, this probably isn't gonna sell 100 million copies, right? It's about how men can be vulnerable. Like yeah. most men don't wanna buy that book. It's this one here. Yeah, so The Mask of Masculinity, I, once I started opening up about my healing journey and seeing the impact and the, the responses that men were having, I was like, gosh, I need to write about this, don't I? Internally, I was like, this needs to happen next. My book agent was like, let's go do another book about business or marketing, and I was like, I just can't do it. Like, even if I make no money, this has to come out of me because if it can help one man heal their internal relationship with themselves and then heal their relationship with their family and their marriage, or whatever it might be, then it's worth it to me. And so I just felt like I needed to put it out. And so I'm happy to help one person and I feel accomplished. I feel purposeful, useful. I feel like my talents were for something meaningful. But I know there's something more inside of me. And so I'm striving to serve 100 million lives. One of the reasons that's meaningful to me is because I believe that we're all here for a reason. I believe that we all have a certain unique set of gifts and talents. 
And I want to see how far those talents can spread. I just feel like that's part of my calling at this season of my life. And I'm 100% happy and fulfilled with all the efforts I've had to this moment because it's everything I've been able to do. But I know there's so much more. So this is just something for me to aim towards, to mm -hmm. reach towards. It gives me a target. It's something I can measure. It's not too unrealistic. It's a big number, but I feel like, yeah, how things are going, maybe it could happen in a year, maybe it's 10 years, I don't know. But it gives me a focus and it keeps me in alignment on the things I say yes and no to. Does this decision, project, interview, uh, partnership serve 100 million lives or get me closer to it? Or is it a distraction? So it helps me get clear on saying yes or no to things as well. And what happens today if you get an email when you leave here and it says, Lewis, good news, we've, we've, we're now reaching 100 million lives a week? I say, great, we gotta, we gotta repeat this over and over again for a while until I feel like, okay, what's the next goal? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, if we get 100 million lives weekly, then I'll be like, awesome. It's been, I'm doing this podcast for nine years now. It's like, I've been doing this for a long time. Last year, we got over 100 million views just on our YouTube channel alone. So we're in the hundreds of millions a year of, and I don't calculate it as like a like or like a one second view. I'm like, what's a 20 minutes mm -hmm. of some an interaction? We had over 100 million just on YouTube of 24 minute watch time. So for me, that's a deep encounter of someone introspective, learning, diving in, you know, overcoming something and trying something new. That's meaningful to me. And so if we can do that weekly for a while, then I'll, I'll take an assessment and say, okay, where am I at in my life this season? Am I striving for more? Am I maintaining? Am I shifting? You know, I'll reassess it then. Would it be a really happy day? I'm happy today. Mm. I'm really happy today. Because Gary Vaynerchuk said to me, he said, my goal is to buy the New York Jets. And in the same breath, he said, it will be the worst day of my life. Right, because then it's no more chase. It's no more thing to work towards. And here's the thing, I'm happy today because I have inner peace. And I think there's no goal that I've accomplished in the past that has brought me inner peace when I accomplished it. I felt depressed and anxious with a lot of goals from the past. Now I feel happy with just showing up and giving my best day to day. It's, as lame as that sounds, the healing work has allowed me, it doesn't mean I'm like satisfied, I still am driven and I'm hungry for more, but I'm just in such a beautiful place in my relationship with myself and my relationship with Martha and my relationship with friends and family, my team, I just feel like, man, if this was it, I'm in a peaceful place and that's beautiful. Amazing. And I, I truly feel it. I truly feel it in everything it, you say. Yeah, and it doesn't mean I'm perfect and it yeah. doesn't mean I have it all figured out and it doesn't mean I'm not gonna make mistakes in the future. It just means that's the path I'm on. We have a closing tradition on this podcast, okay. which is the previous guest writes a question for the next guest into uh -huh. the diary. What is the most frequent piece of advice people ask you for and what is the answer? I mean, well, what do a, people ask me for? What is the most frequent <clears throat> piece of advice people ask you? Like the question they ask the me answer? for, like a piece of advice. Yeah, what's the most frequent piece of advice? I mean, it's get? like, what would you do if you were starting all over again? You know, if you were 21 and you, or you started your podcast again, or you know, you were getting started again in your business, what would you have done differently? Is what I get asked. And then what's the answer? I mean, the answer is, <sighs> I don't know if I would have done anything differently because it's all given me a lot of wisdom and experiences to where I'm at now. I wish I would, I guess I wish I would have like known this stuff sooner, but I think we all need to learn things as they come to us. What I wish, I guess what I wish I would have known differently is how to have inner peace. I wish I would have had that skill because I think I'd be farther ahead and I would have been happier sooner inside had I learned that skill of healing, of inner peace, emotional regulation, all these things that kind of held me back from being 100% my authentic self and in my power towards building everything that I'm doing. I sit here with people a lot and I, I remember speaking to Gary and Gary talked to me about the importance for him of legacy. Yeah. Is this something that's important to you? The concept of legacy? Does I it think yes and no. It is in the sense that like with my dad passing, I think about his legacy, right? And I've had a lot of 
like sad moments. And I've also had a lot of beautiful, grateful moments thinking about his life and his legacy and what he, how he lived, what he taught during his, his life and what he left behind in terms of wisdom and lessons. And I think it's important to, for me, that's valuable in the sense that I'm gonna be around, you know, my siblings are gonna be around, his grandchildren are around who experienced him. They're gonna have, we are gonna have memories and an imprint based on his life and how he lived with us. And now it's all about how we show up through his legacy. You know, I'm a, I'm a part of his legacy. He was a part of my foundation and now I'm gonna be a part of that. And I think about that because I want to make sure that my last name is meaningful and it would make him proud. You know, I wanna make sure that am I doing things in alignment with what he taught me would make the world a better place, would be good for our community. Am I living to the highest level of the values? Not the stuff that he didn't do well, but the stuff he did well do well. And so I think it's important because we're gonna be interacting with people. And when we're gone, they're either thinking of us in a positive way or a negative way, and they might be acting like we acted in either of those ways. So I think it's valuable and important, and I think about it in that sense, but I also think about that it's not important because in 200 years, no one's gonna remember. Maybe, you know, like someone has like a memory of a, in a history book and they talk about you, but no one you know is gonna know you in a in 100 years. No one you interact with is gonna know you. So in the, the, the big, scheme of things, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter after a hundred years really, but it matters because everything is a reflection of our past. It's like dominoes, isn't it? Yeah. My grandparents influenced my parents, their traumas and their beauty influenced them, which influenced me. And I felt like I had to heal the traumas of the past legacy as well just like I'm um, carrying with me the beautiful parts of the past and, and leaning into those, but also healing things that were brought down that they never healed. So there's an impact with the legacy. Yeah. I, my answer is very similar to yours in the sense that I, I've never understood why people care about what people, <laughs> like, what people will say about me when I'm gone. Right, right. Like, I don't care, because I, again, if I inv engaged in that thinking, it's the same as caring too much about what they think about me now. now yeah. Like I'm not going to be there. I'm going to be dead. So, but right. I, I, I've never heard it, and it's really refreshing to hear that kind of dominoes yeah. analogy, where like actually the way that I, that the way that I show up is going to impact my kids. Absolutely. They might impact ten, then it's twenty, uh -huh. and it's fifty, and then that's how the world is created. Yeah, um, and I think the traumas that our parents, you know, had or didn't heal, are going to be felt mm. in our childhood and in our adulthood until we heal it. Mm. So. And that might be their grandparents and their grandparents who'd like pass it down. So we either need to heal it now, otherwise we're gonna pass it down to our kids. Lewis, thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, you're a very, very special individual for so many reasons, but I think having had this conversation with you, the, the most, and also, you know, it's a reflection of your book as well, The Mask of Masculinity, is your ability to be open and vulnerable is I think like the most powerful service, especially men can be doing in this world for all the reasons we've described, because that like emo being emotionally in touch and being willing to be open is the foundation of all of our interactions, our happiness, our mental mm -hmm. health, our, even our physical health. And as, as is the case in this country at the moment, the thing that is unfortunately killing most men under the age of 45 is themselves. Mm -hmm. Suicide is the biggest killer of men in, in, in our country under that age group. Wow. So, and it's a reflection of, I think, the lack of um, vulnerability Absolutely. and the lack of openness and the lack of uh, ability to process and regulate our emotions. So having a light like you in the world that is leading that crusade in such an open way, even though I know the feeling of discomfort, it can it even gives me to talk about right. things like my mental health or how I'm feeling or all those things inspires me. And you've inspired mm -hmm. me to be more open. And in fact, you've actually inspired me to go on the journey of like having therapy just for the sake of, mm. not because there's, I'm like, oh, I need to fix this, but because of the prevention and because Absolutely. of all the unknown unknowns. Absolutely, man. So thank you. It. Thanks, you're, you're an inspiration to me and so many others, and it's been a joy to have you on my podcast. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it.